Sunday Baroque Conversations is made possible by the Friends of Sunday Baroque and is produced at WSHU Public Radio in Fairfield, Connecticut. I'm Suzanne Bona. Thanks for listening. Don't miss an episode of Sunday Baroque Conversations. Subscribe on Apple, Google, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please leave us a review. If you want to find out where you can listen to our weekly show, visit our website, sundaybaroque.org, for a station list and our 24-7 stream. Again, that's sundaybaroque.org. Rachel Barton Pine is an award-winning violinist with an international career as a performer, a curious and adventurous musician whose interests range from classical to heavy metal, big orchestral works to small Baroque chamber music. She's also founder and foundation president of the Rachel Barton Pine Foundation, which assists young artists. The foundation is also an umbrella organization for a project called Music by Black Composers and... She's mom to Sylvia, who is also a talented young violinist. Rachel Barton Pine joins me on Zoom to talk about her fall 2022 release of her recording violin concertos by Black composers through the centuries. Welcome. Great to be back. Thank you so much for making time to chat. So your 2022 recording is a special edition reissue of your 1997 recording, of concertos by several composers. Do you want to talk a little bit about sort of where where you started in 1997 and then we'll bring us up to date for the 2022 yeah. CD? Yeah, it's, a, it's amazing to think that that was 25 years <laughs> <Right>. ago already. <laughs> so um, basically, um, living here in Chicago, uh, I was very aware of this body of repertoire thanks to a number of performing arts groups in town who um, already back in the 90s, we're performing a diversity of repertoire and a research facility that um, sadly no longer exists as it once did, but was um, the best in the nation for decades called the Center for Black Music Research. So when it was time to make my first concerto record, um, I was really curious to see you know, what might exist for violin and orchestra by composers of African descent. Being the research geek that I am, I went over to CBMR and started digging around and um, looked in other places as well, and I found a number of really exciting things from the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. The original disc ended up including, um, of course, Joseph Bologna, the Chevalier de Saint-Georges, the great Afro-French composer that's getting ever more attention these mm -hmm. days, um, the classical period guy who was the greatest swordsman in Europe, as well as the most important violinist and composer in France at the time. Um, and then also um, a not yet no, as well known as he ought to be, but hopefully that's going to turn around. Jose White, um, Afro-Cuban violinist who studied at the Paris Conservatoire, was a classmate and colleague of Sarasate Vignoski and Vuitton, and his concerto is an absolute masterpiece of its type. Um, virtuoso, lush, romantic, gorgeous melodies, um, you know, lots of drama and passion, lots of fireworks, just an incredible concerto. And then Samuel Coleridge Taylor, who of course wrote a beautiful violin con concerto, but there wasn't enough time on the disc to squish it on. Um, so I recorded his um, amazing romance for violin and orchestra. Um, Coleridge Taylor, of course, is the Afro-English composer from the Victorian era, who was renowned as a violinist, conductor, and composer, and you know one of the most important British composers of his day. Hugely successful guy and um, and very inspiring figure for um, the African American classical music community at the time. I could tell you more about each of those guys, <laughs> but the thing I want to tell you right off the bat is that there was a fourth composer on the original album, another Chevalier. Um, from the classical period, Chevalier de Moudemont Pa. Now he's a pretty obscure guy. No visual image of him exists like a painting or anything, mm -hmm. um, but he was always referred to as Le Noir, Chevalier de Moudemont Pa, Le Noir. So for decades and decades, the leading black music researchers said, well, obviously he must be of African descent mm -hmm. um, and considered him to be a black composer. Well, 
after the disc was already released a number of years later, further research uncovered the fact that this Murumam Pagai had ridden in a regiment of the French army that all used black horses. Oh. And so the Lenoir was his mount and not his melanin. So it's still a charming concerto. I'm glad I learned and recorded it, but it no longer belongs on my Violin Concertos by Black Composers album, clearly. <laughs> and then at this, you know, in musicology, you gain some and you lose some and it all evens out. So at the time that I was researching um, my album in the 90s, um, I came across just one single page of a manuscript of a Florence Price Violin Concerto. Mm -hmm. And I was told um, by the archivist that um, this work, as well as many of her other works, were considered lost for, forever, that there was no hope, they would never be found, they would never be heard, they would never be played. And it was really heartbreaking, really tragic, because I knew Florence Price's compositional voice from, you know, some of her her um, songs that I had heard, mm -hmm. a little bit of her chamber music. And so I knew just what, you know, what a just phenomenal composer she was and and I knew that her violin concerto must be great and it was just you know so heartbreaking so you know by a miracle one of those things you think you know it's like a story you can't even make up just a few years ago um, a treasure trove of her manuscripts was discovered in an old trunk in an abandoned farmhouse wow and you know chamber music and symphonic works and all kinds of stuff in both of her violin concertos so of course I recorded her Violin Concerto Number no. 2 and added that to the album. And in a way, this is the album as it would have been in 97 had I been able to actually make it. So um, I love the fact that, you know, we're bringing um, guys like Jose White and Coleridge Taylor and Joseph Bologna, the Chevalier de Saint-Georges, back to people's attention, but also um, helping introduce the Florence Price Concerto to wider recognition and yeah, I couldn't be more excited. Yeah, yeah. And um, I would love for you to just, if you can give like the little uh, snapshot of, of what you love about each of these pieces in particular that you've included on this recording. Because again, I think people aren't as familiar with their work and they are really special and unique voices, each one of them. And and so at, with you having this intimate knowledge of this music, I'd love for you to, to, to talk about what are the elements that make each of these concertos outstanding. Absolutely. Well, I guess I'll go in chronological order. Okay. So Chevalier de Saint-Georges, um, you know, he's often referred to as the Black Mozart, but that's, as my daughter pointed out, um, when she was <laughs> little and first studying her first Joseph Bologna piece, uh, she was like, Mommy, that's backwards. Uh, he, mm -hmm. Mozart should be the white Saint George, right? Because of course it was <laughs> it was the younger Wolfgang who was inspired and influenced by the the playing and the compositions of Bologna. For example, um, Saint George wrote uh, viol uh, symphonious concertants, mm -hmm. um, and it was those that inspired Mozart to take up the genre. Mm -hmm. So, kind of an amazing history. He. Um, was as i said the best swordsman in all of europe which is incredible basically a, a friend of mine pointed out um it would be as if he had the uh, you know athleticism of michael jordan combined with and i know you know it's a squidgy thing to say but it works as a great analogy um michael jordan plus michael jackson <laughs> so like <laughs> one of the best musicians one of the best athletes or yeah. i guess the modern day equivalent would even be like you know an elite olympic athlete and a top concert violinist at the same time. No mm -hmm. person like this even exists today. And it's amazing to think that one right. once did, but musically speaking, so his pieces are more virtuosic than anything Mozart ever did. They go higher up on the fingerboard. They have all kinds of cutting edge um, figurations for the violin and even some moments of string crosses that I'm convinced were inspired by his fencing. <laughs> <Where> you're like <laughs> whipping your bow through the air, like it's a rapier, <laughs> um, but absolutely charming and in a way you know just from a listener's perspective i think it's you know forget the fact that he's a black composer of course that's important for representation and history and everything but the fact that he's a classical period french composer because when it comes to violin concertos you know we end up hearing mozart of course and then haydn and then you know some of the b-list german dudes like stamitz and hofmeister and whoever, Dittersdorf, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> but, you know, when do we ever hear a classical period concerto by a French composer? And it is a very different aesthetic um, where the, you know, there's just all these really catchy melodies, but it's got a lightness and an elegance to it. And so I think, 
you know, just listening to it, it's it's just so charming. He, um, Bologna actually wrote um, more than a dozen violin concertos, and this A major um, was I, I learned them all in order to prepare mm -hmm. for the disc and mm -hmm. chose my favorite back in '97. And actually, having revisited them over the years, the A major remains my favorite. So. Um, it's not any better than his other. He's got great ones, but for whatever reason, this is my personal favorite. I just love it. Hmm. Um, Jose White um, is was really one of those great violinist composers. He didn't write symphonies. He didn't write string quartets. Not all, you know, no operas like Saint Georges. But he wrote, you know, a body of repertoire similar to Sarasate. All of these recital pieces, you know, that are melodic, virtuosic, um, and like Sarasate's Spanish flavor with his compositions, um, Jose White, you know, brings a, a Cuban flavor to um, many of his violin and piano works. Interestingly, the violin concerto sounds completely European. There are no no elements of you know his Caribbean origin um, buried in there, but it's an excellent example of its type. I mean, every bit as wonderful as something by Vinyelsky. So it's, you know, it's not like, oh, he's a romantic period composer, we should compare his concerto to Brahms, because it's, you know, it's a different animal, but definitely, you know, within that type of, you know, Vuitton, Vinyelsky kind of stuff, um, it absolutely stands up and, you know, wonderfully orchestrated. And um, what's really interesting, and um, after I recorded it, I was like, wow, this piece is such, you know, a gift to the violin world, you know, this needs to, you know, regain the place it would have had in our repertoire all along, mm -hmm. if not for, you know, historic bias. And yet for 25 years, every time I would suggest to an orchestra that they program it, nobody was willing, absolutely nobody. Huh. Um, and understandably not-for-profits have to think about, you know, playing works that their audiences already know and love so that they can sell tickets and continue sure. to survive. So I get that. But, you know, even when it was a return engagement and the public in that town already knew me, I, I just couldn't get anybody to program this piece. And I began to despair. And I actually mm -hmm. said, if I ever get to finally perform the Jose White Concerto, I'll know that the world has finally changed. And what do you know, starting last year, orchestras on their own initiative have started to ask me to play it. Mm. So I couldn't be more thrilled to finally be sharing it with audiences, not just on the album, but live in concert. And it's been every bit as appealing to the listeners as I always knew it would be. And super fun for me to get up and do on stage. And um, yeah, hoping that more colleagues will take it up and that it'll just become one of our concertos and it's you know in terms of representation of course it's super awesome that he's not only a black composer but also um, counts as a latino composer so there's you know lots of people that can really embrace him um but of course you know he's appealing to all fans of the violin right. Coleridge taylor um is an interesting composer historically um, his music sounds like you know lush english music of the turn of the last century um but he had um you know a very successful career at a time when on the other side of the ocean, there were not so many opportunities for African-American classical musicians. And so, you know, they looked to Samuel Coleridge Taylor as a huge, you know, like really a hero. In fact, many classical music organizations started by um, African-Americans were often titled Samuel Coleridge Taylor societies. Hmm. And um, Booker T. Washington wrote the introduction to a collection of Coleridge Taylor's um, concert settings of spirituals that and he called him the greatest musician of our race and w.e.b dubois eventually brought him over to the u.s and he had a very successful visit here his oratorio hiawatha um, based on the longfellow poem for many years was actually the most frequently performed oratorio in the world even beating out the handel messiah mm. if you can believe that so he was you know really popular and successful in his day and then you know, as happens with so many of these guys, once he was no longer alive, you know, the bias really took hold and his music was brushed aside. Um, a lot of things are still out of print. Um, of course, in the case of Jose White, a lot of things were in manuscript only. Um, yeah, so not having the availability of the sheet music, of course, is part of what inspired my Music by Black Composers project, which we started in 2001, and also to be able to provide um, pedagogically appropriate versions of a lot of this repertoire. Um, to children and yeah and then florence price um well in terms of representation i'm very proud of the fact that she also counts as a chicago composer she oh. was born in little rock but made her career here studied here and um 
you know, is part of what's referred to as the Chicago Red, um, Renaissance. So we all know the Harlem Renaissance, the 1940s flowering of intellectual and artistic life among the African-American community, such composers as William Grant Still, poets like Langston Hughes and all of those guys. In Chicago, fascinatingly, in the 50s, um, there was what's called the Chicago Re Renaissance, um, kind of a similar um, flourishing of a accomplishment and achievement among African-Americans. Uh, but musically, the, the classical music portion of that um, of that flowering was was led by um, some amazing women, and Florence Price was one of them. Um, there were so few opportunities, and these ladies would would really encourage each other. And I don't think any of them would have accomplished all that she did without the others there to support her. But it's uh, as I've been talking about this in interviews, I didn't think about it until I started until the album was out and I started giving interviews. But when you think about the fact that Florence Price wrote. Um, these two violin concertos, of which the second is really her masterpiece of the genre, written just a year before her death. Um, why did she write them? Because normally one writes a violin concerto because a violinist, you know, asks you to, or there's a, you know, a concert in the offing, you know, a commission mm -hmm. essentially. And there was nobody, you know, <clears throat> playing this concerto. She never got to hear it. There are very few opportunities for African-American composers or for women composers, if you were a black woman, forget about it. Uh, and yet she wrote this concerto anyway. And I'm thinking to myself, my gosh, she must have just had it inside of her, that it was in her heart and she just had to get it on paper. And that she must, this, this is an incredible statement of optimism because she must have been hoping that someday in the future, the world would be a better place and her music would get heard. And indeed, you know, it, it did, it, it and it is. And you know, so her dreams have come true, you know, long after her passing. Mm. Um, but it's, you know, so many women composers, you know, uh, from throughout the centuries didn't write in certain genres. You know, Amy Beach didn't write a violin concerto. Um, you know, so many of them didn't write symphonies uh, because they, they just were getting played. And yet, right. you know, Florence Price, thankfully, left us this piece anyway, which is just amazing to think of. And as far as a piece goes, I mean, it's, you know, everything we love about Florence Price with her, her beautiful melodies and really interesting, you know, just textures and, and colors and um, emotional sweep. Um, it's a one movement concerto, but doesn't feel at all skimpy. It, it just has a lot of internal structure and, um, you know, different episodes and just feels so fully satisfying and uplifting mm -hmm. when you hear it. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. mix of a lot of different things. Um, in fact, on our NBC website, which is musicbyblackcomposers.org, we have um, tons and tons of free resources for students and teachers and music lovers and um, professional performers, um, repertoire directories, including um, a searchable list with in info of where to get the music and, you know, all of that you know, instrumentation, length, all that good stuff um, for works by violin and orchestra. So you can see that these are these are not, you know, just the best. There's lots of other good stuff. There's, you know, more to to discover. And it, um, on the website, we've got a list of children's books. We've got podcasts. So we've got bibliographies, presentation materials for school performances. And of course, we do have our publications um, like our pedagogical volumes, our coloring book of 40 composers, and all four composers from my album um, did make the cut, um, <laughs> and our timeline poster. We've got directories of more than 300 living composers and more than 150 historic composers. So when you look at the body of repertoire from um, the centuries and all the different, you know, most of the different continents of the planet, um, it's not just a question of a few rare individuals. There is actually a significant depth and breadth to um, the activity of composers of African descent through the years. And so um, one of the things I always urge um, performers and organizations is, okay, don't just start playing San George and Coleridge Taylor and Florence Price and, you know, the living um, wonderful composers like Jesse Montgomery and Carlos Simon. Don't just play. I mean, of course, you know, all of them deserve as many concerts as they can get. That goes without saying, but there are so much more, you know, don't just play the few you've heard of and, and let the rest remain 
in obscurity because right. there's a lot more where that came from. Right. Right. Do do your homework, in other words. <laughs> and, well, and it's yeah. and it's fun. You know, yeah. homework sounds burdensome, but this is like super exciting, yeah. you know, process of discovery. This is what we live for. Yeah. Like, you know, finding ever more great music. Right. And right. It's, a, it's a good time to be in classical right now because we are like and rather than being wary of stuff that hasn't already been famous, we're realizing, wait a sec, we've been We've been literally missing out. We've been denied this awesome stuff. Yeah. And now, you know, things, I mean, now it's like we're excited to discover it, and, you know, whether we're players or listeners. And it's a, yeah, it's a great time yeah. um, to be doing this. I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I really admire what, what you've done. I, I kind of see this, um, particularly in this moment, but I've always seen it as, you know, the, these, um, this is an all hands on deck situation. We all have an important role to play in, in making sure that this very worthy music and very worthy musicians have, have their, um, moment on the stage and on, on the recordings. Um, Absolutely. And classical is, you know, a richer art form if yeah. we're all part of the conversation, for yeah. sure. Yeah. I, I know you've, you know, so you're doing this amazing work here through your project, Music by Black Composers. Um, what can the rest of us do? What, what kind of, what would you like to see? What would you like to see uh, in terms of what musicians do, what broadcasters do, what arts administrators do? How do we represent more diversity on stage, on programs, on boards and in administrations and and in the audience too. How do we, how do we do that? What what do you what would you like to see? Yeah, thank you for mentioning board and administration because that mm -hmm. is such an important part of the puzzle. I've been on the board of Sphinx um, for for a couple of decades speaking of boards and yeah, and that's one of the things that we've been working on is, you know, just trying to make sure that there's inclusion at every um, level mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, there's participation and nothing is, is tokenism. Um, right. You know, like I said, I think exploring the answers, not just copying what others are doing, but thinking for ourselves, mm -hmm. not just, okay, I need a work by a African-American woman composer. Okay. I've heard of Florence Price. Let's play something by her. Check that box done. No. What about all the others, you know, and, but actually the best answer I can give to that, um, you know, young people, college students and so on are constantly asking me, what should I be performing? And it's great that they're thinking of it that way because there is a should element. We should be playing works by composers of color. We should be playing works by composers by diff of different genders, et cetera. Um, but we shouldn't only do it because we should do it, right? Um, because then it becomes like a duty and it's it, right. it's like, well, what about the music? We don't play Brahms because, oh, we should play something by a, a German male. Right. No, we play Brahms because we love Brahms. Right. And that's the answer. It's like, once you get to know this stuff, you, you are definitely going to find things that you love. There's such a diversity of different styles and voices and such a quantity of potential repertoire. So I, I always say, you know, the one thing we have to do different is we have to actively seek it out, right? So if mm -hmm. you're, you know, a grad student trying to decide which romantic sonata to play for your recital, you know, one kid might be like, I really love the franc. Another kid might be, I've been dying to do the Schumann. You know, why do we know this? Because we kind of know that rep. We've heard professionals perform it. We've heard albums. We've mm -hmm. heard our classmates play it all through the years. So it's like out there. This stuff is not yet enough out there. So we have to actively get the music from the library, listen, you know, maybe dig up a, a recording that someone has done, uh, look at the sheet music, play it, try it out. And then what we choose should be the pieces that we're dying to play, the pieces that we absolutely love, the ones that have become our favorites. And I think um, my own personal performing life is a good example of what we hope will ultimately happen, you know, for everyone, mm -hmm. um, because I've you know, been digging into this stuff for so many years and not just black composers, but, you know, women composers, Latino composers, Asian composers, all kinds of different composers. Um, when I go to make a set list, whether it's for a recital, a private soiree, a radio station performance, a school visit, choosing an encore after a concerto, you know, all of these different times where I get to pick what I'm going to play. My set lists tend to be pretty darn diverse, but I rarely even think about that they're diverse by default because I play a diversity of repertoire, no diversity of repertoire. If I'm going to pick what I feel like playing that day or my favorites or what I've been missing lately and want to revisit, 
it's going to be diverse because that's the re- mix of repertoire that that I rotate. Mm-hmm. And so ultimately, and my daughter said to me, you know, mom, instead of a book uh, for kids of all black composers, why don't you have a book of all composers like, you know, mixed together? And I said, well, ultimately, that is where we hope to go, you know, right. that if my project succeeds, it will ultimately be obsolete. Um, <laughs> but we're not there yet. And in order to get there, we first have to specifically highlight these composers um, and, you know, kind of right the ship. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. And what and what a wise observation by your daughter. So let's let's sort of let's ease into that, because that's something that's that's new since your 1997 recording. You are now a mom. And your daughter, Sylvie, is also a violinist. And the two of you are quite a team. I like to fo- focus or feature you um, now and then on the uh, the daily blog that I have, Beautiful Music Now. Um, you, you make these wonderful, informative videos together. And she's very confident mm-hmm. and very wise. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how she first started making music and and uh, and you know, sort of what what you like to do together and what you hope to do together in the future. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so you know, she started lessons when she was two and a half, as one does. I was actually thinking, oh, maybe she should play the cello, kind of mix it up. And my husband was like, we are not getting on an airplane with a cello every week. Oh, I was like, yeah, he's a smart man. Point. Um, <laughs> Piccolo, maybe. And, <laughs> yeah, and he, my husband, had grown up playing violin before he, you know, went to college for you know, finance and then started his computer company and whatever. So, you know, he also knew and loved the violin and it just seemed like the thing to do. And, yeah. um, but interestingly, when she was four, Sylvia started self-identifying as a composer. If you mm-hmm. would say to Sylvia, oh, are you a musician also? She would say, yes, I'm a composer. And you had to, to ask her, do you play an instrument? And then she would say, yes, I play the violin. But unlike me at that age, she didn't self-identify as a violinist. Hmm. Um, but as a composer and melodies, you know, just since that age, since age four, she just sings all day long. Melodies just pour out of her huh. and, you know, certainly a different um, than than me. I'm, you know, like always super excited to play other people's music. And my daughter just loves to improvise. And, you know, she gets more excited to when others are playing her music than even for her own concerts. But of course, she also loves performing. And these days, you know, there's many careers being made where, where you do both. Uh, Jesse Montgomery is a great example of that as a, a modern day violinist and composer. So um, we've I've been delighted that we've started to do double concertos together. We were actually supposed to have um, play double concertos with four orchestras in 2020 and it all went poof. But we've mm-hmm. now started to get back to it. We um, played a Vivaldi double in Israel on tour with the Tel Aviv soloists. Um, back in, I think, March, and um, we just collaborated with the Baroque Orchestra. And I should mention that my daughter um, is the only 11-year-old in the U.S. to be um, studying Baroque violin seriously. She mm. got her first gut-strung instrument, you know, at, when she was seven. Mm. Um, it was just, a you know, a modified modern instrument with the strings and the tailpiece and the Baroque bow. Um, now that she just got tall enough to use full-size violins, um, she has a real Baroque violin um, that she has played professionally with, um, at doing trio sonatas with my chamber group, Trio Sedicento. Um, and she's, yeah, really excited about that. She's done early music classes through Seattle Historical Arts for Kids, learning how to play arm-held Renaissance violin wow. and medieval Rebec and VL. Um, and yeah, and then besides that, she sings and I'm making her learn piano because, of course, you have to have keyboard skills as a composer. So it's a pretty busy, wow. busy musical life and I'm her practicing parent. So that's a, a great joy to be helping her with her daily studies. And um, and then, of course, playing duets together is a dream come true. Yeah. I always say, you know, I, I never wanted to have ambitions for my child because, you know, a child's life you know their their loves and their career they it has to be theirs not Mm -hmm. their parents Mm -hmm. um and so i wanted to you know i aspired to support my daughter in whatever her interests were whether or not they related to mine Um, but i definitely as with every child you know hoped that mine would um, grow up understanding and getting a love for music so that whether she's on stage or in the audience in her adulthood that she can you know really enjoy music you know Mm -hmm. whether she was 
you know, a, someone who did it as an avocation, playing in their local community orchestra and doing string quartets with friends, fiddling at, you know, the pubs, which we love to do. Um, but it's pretty clear that she will, in fact, make this her profession. I mean, literally, she already is. Um, and yeah, it's it's a great joy. And I'm I'm very, very lucky. We have lots of fun. It's... And if you want to learn more about Sylvia Pine, you can, of course, go to sylviapine.com or especially oh. check out her Instagram. Oh, yeah, she's she's all that. <laughs> she really is. Oh, and, yeah, and she has a YouTube and, you know, all that good stuff. That's great. But, um, but yeah, she's she's really always very excited about learning more about different yeah. kinds of music. And, yeah. Well, um, yeah, it's been it's been really cool. <laughs> she definitely improvises better than me, and oh. um, she's already composed, you know, more chamber and symphonic works in her lifetime thus far at age eleven than I probably ever will. I mean, yeah, more than I've done thus far, and more than I ever will before. Uh, it's the oh. end of my life. So, yeah, oh, so wow. she's that is her thing. Well, maybe the next time we have to have Sylvia part of the uh, interview as well. Yeah. yeah, well, that'd be awesome. We're planning an album, actually. Um, okay. My uh, Baroque trio, Trio Settecento, has put together a really cool set of um, Christmas-themed um, rep for two violins and, of course, the, the cello slash viola da gamba and harpsichord oh. with David Schrader and Jack Mark Rosendahl. Yeah. And we're starting to tour the program, um, not this year, but starting next year, obviously, because these things take a little while to cycle through with the bookings sure. um, and planning to also make an album of that stuff, um, Baroque um, string rep um, for oh. the Christmas season. And Sylvia's going to do that with me. And um, yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to put that on my calendar for us to, to chat all three of us then next year. That'll be, that'll be great. And well done, by the way. Well done, Sylvia. Well done, Mom and Dad. <laughs> <laughs> I have been speaking on Zoom to world-renowned violinist Rachel Barton Pine about her career as a soloist and chamber musician, an advocate for young musicians, and a champion of black and other underrepresented composers and musicians. Thank you so much. What a great conversation. Oh, well, it's always a pleasure to talk to you.